All right. Welcome, everyone. Uh, welcome to the series of interactions, Visionaries Unplugged, a series of interactions with our VOH incubator experts. My name is Khushbu Sharma, and I had the collaborations and industry outreach at Voice of Healthcare and Voice of Healthcare Incubator. And by bringing together our set of mentors, advisors, and experts on the incubator panel, the overall idea is that we intend to unveil their wisdom and experiences through these interactions. Now, today, my guest is somebody who has been very closely witnessing the growth of Voice of Healthcare and Voice of Healthcare Incubator since almost the start and somebody who has been an editor and guide to so many of our incubators. I have with me Mr. Gaurav Agarwal, Managing Director of Innovation Imaging Technologies Private Limited. Gaurav is a healthpreneur and angel investor, mentor based out of Bangalore, and has a strong history of incubating and scaling up startups. Being the co-founder of IITPL, that's rated among the top 10 medtech startups of India. Co-founder and, you know, I'm sorry. Co-founder of IITPL, winner of DOP, Medical Device Company of the Year, Good Design Award, CII Top 25 Innovative Companies Award, Red Dot Award, and CII Industrial Design Excellence Award, and also the winner of National Innovation Award by President of India. And I'm very sure so many more accolades that I might have missed and so many that might be coming up. Thank you so much, Gaurav, for being with here today. It's a pleasure to have you. Thank you very much, uh, Kushbu, for inviting me. A pleasure to be associated with the uh, VOH Incubator. And uh, thank you very much for taking our time for this interaction. No, absolutely. It's our honor. Uh, as I said, leveraging your immense expertise in the domain of medical device and technology, today we shall be discussing around the innovations in medical devices and which sets to be a guide for the startup entrepreneurs. Uh, now, to begin with our interactions and questions, I'm sure there hardly would be anybody in the health tech industry or medical device industry who would not know the kind of difference that IIT field has made and the contribution that you have made in the industry already. But I'm also sure that not many of them might know the journey that eventually led to IIT field. Bringing into the fact that you have a background of being a biomedical engineer. I would just start by asking that what exactly led you to the journey of building up a health tech startup and that too in the cardiovascular space. So let's let's begin with the journey there. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, today, uh, Kushbu, we are known as Involution. So uh, I'm a co-founder of two companies, IITPL and Involution. The parent company was Involution, and uh, today we've merged both the companies and raised Series A capital. Uh, so to your question, biomedical engineering is a curriculum specially designed for the medical device industry. Uh, it is a multidisciplinary course with exposure to life sciences, as well as engineering streams, like electrical engineering, electronics engineering, and medical electronics, specifically. So I think my exposure um, uh, to Having seen medical devices up close and personal, which includes a wide array of uh, disciplines like diagnostics, implantable devices, uh, surgical consumables, and even medical equipments. Uh, I was fortunate as part of my curriculum, I was able to witness all of these equipments and devices uh, save and improve lives. And that ignited a very keen interest in development, uh, research, and commercialization of these technologies. Uh, very early on in my journey, I was fortunate to work uh, with an iconic company called Guided in cardiovascular space uh, that at the point in early 2000s had the claim to fame that every second stent used in the world was a guided stent. They had 50% market share globally in stents. It was a very innovative company and uh, was widely respected. Uh, so that's where my journey with cardiovascular devices began. And uh, back in the day, in 2000s, you would see, uh, I was based out of Chennai at that time, and you would see that at Apollo's and Fortis hospitals, you would have a lot of patients arrive, uh, uh, you, you would have a lot of patients come dead on arrival. You know, some people would travel from 600, 700 kilometers with uh, acute heart condition, and they would eventually not make it. And being part of that ecosystem, visiting those hospitals and cardiologists, it was extremely painful to see that people who couldn't afford therapy was a different question and a different solution altogether. But even people who could afford therapy did not have 
any facility for cardiovascular treatment in the vicinity. Uh, that is how my journey in cardiovascular devices began. And today, out of my quarter of a century long experience, uh, about 23 years has only been in the cardiovascular devices space. And for another quarter of a century, if I live that long, I uh, will continue to be in the same space. 23 years is a very long time, Gaurav. Uh, right. While while I mentioned in the introduction as well that you have been closely involved with mentoring and guiding uh, some of our startups and also being an angel investor at your capacity. Uh, so many startups uh, and I'm sure that throughout these journeys and interactions you come across through so many startups that have so many great ideas and, and, and incubations. But I'm sure not many of them reach to their intention destination and there might be some lags pitfalls somewhere in the journey. But from your experiences, uh, how can startup entrepreneurs, and I'm talking about specifically medical devices industry, they can identify the unmet needs in the medical device market and develop solutions that truly address these needs. And I'm sure there are many some common challenges, but yeah, we'll talk about them later. Sure. So I think it's a very pertinent question. Um... If you step back about eight years or ten years uh, in time, there were not many startups even uh, venturing into medical devices because it was seen as a very capital intensive and a highly regulated area where the chances of success were very, very tiny. But I think with enabling policy infrastructure and also a very strong domestic consumption story, I think, uh, uh, and also a lot of institutions of excellence like IITs and ICMR setting up innovation centers in the country. Now I'm, I myself am an advisor to at least half a dozen very innovative startups. Uh, so my mantra for all startups is very simple. It's an ABC framework, can't get simpler than that. The first is that, uh, you know, if you're targeting India as a market or any market, I think affordability comes at the top of the food chain. You know, you could be building solutions that are extremely fancy or novel or are cutting edge. But if the population that it is intended for cannot afford them, you know, uh, no matter how sophisticated the solution is, it will not work. And I've seen uh, in our own industry, we've seen some uh, robotics companies launch extremely expensive robots uh, that did extremely well. But because they were unaffordable, you know, the therapy diet, it's natural. And there are several such examples uh, in, 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 the, in those of history where a lot of medical devices were very useful, but because they were completely outpriced, they, they uh, couldn't make the cut. So that is the A part of it. The B part of it is beneficial. You know, we must not lose sight of the fact that any medical device in any space is ultimately intended to either save or improve lives. You know, and... Uh, there are predicate devices that already exist for something that you're uh, building. You know, for example, you take any field, oncotherapy, orthopedics, cardiology. Any solution that you're building is being addressed by some predicate device. You could improve the outcomes by making the device more affordable or making it more user friendly or improving the clinical outcomes directly. You know, so you have to make sure that whatever you're building has distinct clinical benefits over what is available in the market. And third, which is where a lot of startups fail, it has to be commercially viable. You know, if you're building a product for which the market is only restricted to 5 or 10% of the available market, you know, you're already skating on very thin ice. Um, and I think later on in our interaction, we can touch upon how startups can not only look at India as a market, but they need to look at the entire global market because India is less than two and a half percent of the global medical device market. Growing extremely fast, but I think if you do not have the vision of making in India for the globe, you will at some point in time reach either saturation or extinction. So um, that was my simple ABC framework. 
Thanks, thanks, Gaurav, for that. And while we are talking about your staple ABCs that come that covers right from affordability till how it is commercially viable, um, I'm sure even if it may, matches somehow these ABC standards, uh, there is also a factor that comes into a place which is called as the compliance and regulatory standards. Now, all of us know how the regulatory standards and compliance process could be sometimes it would be really robust for some of the startups that just do not know how to prob probably go out and venture in this space so and also i'm sure that while you're closely witnessing so many startups and their evolution uh, there might have been some challenges that are related to strict regulatory requirements when it comes to our country just a piece of advice from your end how can startup entrepreneurs strike a balance between innovation and making sure to keep up the compliance and regulatory standards and also are there any other challenges that you would like to highlight on how they can navigate these challenges and bring their innovations to the market successfully yeah so another very pertinent question um, i think in my opinion one of the key aspects uh, of commercial success in a highly regulated uh, industry like the medical device or the medical industry is having a very clearly defined regulatory strategy. Right. Uh, and regulatory is also uh, because medical devices itself is a very complex interplay of multiple disciplines. I'll give you an example. For example, pharmaceuticals, you know, uh, the only input really is chemicals. If you understand chemicals and their regulations and chemical engineering well, you're likely to have success in the pharmaceutical. In medical in, in medical device industry, you know there is uh, there is confluence of electrical engineering, mechanical engineering, electronics engineering, drugs, chemical engineering, and several others. So it's a confluence of all of these disciplines. So being an interdisciplinary field, the regulations vary dramatically across sectors. So the standards that are applicable for diagnostics are not the same that apply for implantables. What applies to implantables is not the same for equipments. And within equipments also, X-ray equipments and uh, other equipments have very, very different standards. So one of the things that I strongly recommend uh, uh, to health tech entrepreneurs is, you know, start your journey with a very, very defined regulatory strategy. And your regulatory strategy should ideally be derived from your go-to market. So, for example, if your target market is only India for the near future, three to five years post-commercialization, you know, draw out a regulatory pathway for approval of the products within India. But today, uh, interestingly, across all large uh, countries in the world, regulatory standards are being harmonized. You know, so you do not have very dramatically different regulatory standards. There are, of course, exceptions to this rule, like America has its own standard of US FDA, uh, Korea, Japan, their own regulatory standards. But if you comply to MDR 2017, which is the current recent uh, medical device regulation, and you obtain CMARC approval for your device, it opens up about 70% of the world's market. By number of countries, not by revenue, because by revenue, uh, Japan and US are, are really large. So my advice would be, and today there is enough regulatory advice, very strong regulatory advice available through consultancy. You do not have to hire very expensive regulatory experts. You can outsource that. And uh, there are lots of Indian devices that are now C marked and even US FDA approved. So there is enough and more help available in the country, uh, either through third party or regulatory experts that you can choose to have in house. But I think a very clearly defined regulatory strategy holds the key to success uh, in this industry. Sure, sure. Yeah, that's what we said. That I mean, we all of us very clearly know the the very compliant regulatory robust process that there is in place specifically for medical devices now. You very clearly and evidently mentioned in one of the previous um, questions that I had about how uh, the startups and the minds behind startups should also take in consideration the share that India holds globally in the medical device industry. And you sure that, and you also said that uh, 
if you are intending to make a real impact you should look at make in india and how make in india can globally make a difference now with your global experience karav how do you see the landscape of medical device innovations varying across different regions and what maybe a couple of lessons that our founders can learn from the international trends that are around the medical device industry yeah so kushbu i'd like to answer this question in two parts uh, one is innovation focused on india you know uh, if you're a relatively small startup you're obviously uh, your first port of call or first port of sale would be india and i think in india uh, i i see with a lot of uh, engineering institutions of excellence there is a huge and unproportionately high focus on uh, path breaking research path breaking fundamental research you know i think for a country of our size which is 80% dependent on imports for medical devices there is very it's very important for medtech founders or startup founders to focus on translational research i'll give you an example for example uh, if your goal is to build an ultrasound machine you know you should have an idea of what application would it serve that would lead to a specification lock and ultimately you would create with uh, a university that has the capabilities or an engineering institution that has the capabilities to deliver that uh, concept so that is called translational research when you have an idea that serves a particular disease sector or a particular segment of patients and you translate that into product, that is translational research unfortunately very few uh, institutes in india are focused on translational research they consider it below their standard to do translational research they think it's only fundamental research depends them paid and so i think that mindset is uh, second for a country of our size where uh, still 40% of the healthcare delivery is in tier 2 and tier 3 cities where affordability is a key challenge i think frugal innovation is also very important you know uh, what i mean by innovation is that if a device or a equipment or a reagent already exists if you can innovate and bring the costs down significantly and make it more accessible i think that frugal innovation is far more beneficial than fundamental path breaking research and the third is reverse engineering as uh, as uh, unfashionable as it may sound you know for a country of a size which is so dependent on imports i think reverse engineering also is something that should be considered in areas of very high import prices so this is now about the domestic market but about uh, global strategy i mean medical devices is a very high tech and innovation driven industry i think all of us are aware of that product life cycles tend to be extremely short and therefore adaptability to global tech trends will determine your sustainability and commercial viability in the long run there are a lot of companies and we have several examples uh, in the history of uh, uh, corporate world for example a company like a company like kodak for example you know i mean when i was a kid which was several years ago you know kodak was the only uh, film that would be used in cameras but they failed to see the movement to digital photography trend and kodak is not even a shadow of itself same thing with blackberry search in motion at one point in time it was the hottest technology on the market they just couldn't catch up to the touch screen phone market and they did the next similarly in the medical device industry also unless you have an eye on the tech trends that are impacting your industry or therapy segment i think obsolescence is a very distinct reality uh, now to the second part of your question which are technologies that i think will shape the future of healthcare delivery in the world uh, mm -hmm. i bet very big on robotics uh, i think robotics is a trend that is here to stay any procedure that can be done by a human you know the skill sets of surgeons vary across hospitals and across uh, operators robotics delivers you safe repeatable precise outcomes regardless of the setting they deploy you know i have a personal benefit of that my father in law recently had a cancer of the kidney 
and a surgeon, a reputed surgeon in Delhi suggested uh, radical nephrectomy, which is removal of the entire kidney. But with robotics in Bangalore, they were able to preserve about 70% of his kidney and function. That's so robotics, remarkable. yeah, it's absolutely remarkable. And today he's living an extremely healthy life, whereas with one kidney, the life would have got compromised severely. So robotics have a very large role to play. Uh, Involution is personally very invested in the field of robotics. We are likely to launch a cutting edge vascular robot, also a mentor to another very cutting edge robotics, uh, surgical robotics company. The second tech trend that I am a huge believer in is wearables. You know, mm -hmm. today watches have capabilities, and I believe in the entire healthcare continuum of patient. The preventive healthcare and the diagnostic healthcare would largely move to wearables. Mm -hmm. Smart watches and bands have the capability to study your sleep cycle, have the capability to detect an arrhythmia, have the ability to read ECGs very accurately. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think wearables is going to, you know, patients' healthcare continuum, it is preventive health. Then diagnosis, then therapy, and then aftercare. So, out of these four continuums, I think the first two are going to move to the wearable space uh, in the very near future. Another uh, tech trend that I'm a huge believer in is interoperability. You know, uh, which is in an OT environment, you use multiple equipments that don't talk to each other. You know, they have very different outputs. That is beginning to change. You, we are living in a very interconnected world, and mm -hmm. I think an operation theater is also getting more connected. All the devices have the ability to talk to each other and feed off each other's views. And the last uh, that is used in every industry is AI and ML. Uh, mm -hmm. I think this also includes big data. You know, uh, machine learning algorithms have the ability to feed on large amount of data and create very, very predictable and repeatable diagnosis. For example, uh, in echocardiography, in, uh, in cardiology, in our field, there is about 58% adoption of AI. AI generates better diagnosis in eco than most mm -hmm. operators. So AI and ML is another big uh, data trend that health tech innovators need to watch out for. So robotics, wearables, interoperability, AI, uh, those are big tech trends to watch on. Yeah, sure. AI really has made a difference in preventive diagnosis, I must say. I mean, really have been made a mark of how we can probably prevent so many diseases that are coming up in infectious diseases. Just a question. Do you think the, the domain of robotics, AI, interoperability, wearables has been very well explored, explored in the Indian market or do you see a scope still, I mean, for the next gen entrepreneurs there? I think robotics and AI and ML, there's a lot of work happening in India. Um, not so much on the interoperability and the wearable side, but I'm sure as the market begins to gain pace and scale, you know, you will see a lot because there is a lot of capability in India. You look at the best uh, machine learning scientists, artificial intelligence scientists, big data scientists, they are from India, but work in the Silicon Valley or, or Offshore. So, a lot of those would, would come back to India to find startups uh, that will find commercial scale and success in India. I think there is an answer to so many entrepreneurs that probably would be viewing this and understanding what is the domain specifically in the medtech industry that could yet be explored. And we've already mentioned a few of them. This is the conclusion of our interaction, Gaurav. But just to just before we part, uh, do you think would you like to give away a couple of pieces of advices, not just for the medical devices industry, just throughout the entrepreneurship phase? I mean, right from the the incubation of an idea to where you know where to go to reach out to funding, where to reach out to people who could guide me through the legal and compliance process. Just a few bits of advices for our uh, sure. people who are watching us. I think if there's one takeaway uh, from my journey of entrepreneurship, uh, it is that it's not for the weak of the heart. You know, if you're mm -hmm. venturing into entrepreneurship, please be prepared for some uh, some phases of extremely uh, 
extremely rough uh, journey and you need to be able to brave that journey for at least three years. In India, an idea after incubation takes at least three to four years to stabilize and reach commercial success. The second, uh, the second uh, uh, sort of tip would be that we live in an age of collaboration. You know, uh, so please do not hesitate to collaborate, to improve outcomes, you know, to make the company more financially viable, to improve reach. You know, this is where a lot of Indian entrepreneurs hold their equity very close to their heart. But I think we've seen that partnerships uh, mm. also your chances of success. So please foster the right partnerships, nurture them. And third, you know, if you have an eye on your customer and your people, you know, uh, in, in, in involution, we keep our people first. If we keep our people happy, they keep our customers happy. I think uh, those are three things from my own journey that I would like to advise uh, for any entrepreneur, especially so far medical advice. Sure, sure. Thank you. Talking about collaborations, I mean, Voice of Healthcare has been a thorough advocate of collaborations and synergy. So I really second to that on behalf of VOH. Overall, thank you. Thank you so much, Gaurav, for this interaction. I'm very sure interactions like these could take up hours and days and not even then we'd be able to gain as much insights that there is for any any founder who has built a 23 year old company all on his own so thank you so much Gaurav for today and I hope we continue building such discussions at VOH Incubator and we continue making the impact that we are doing so thank you for your time today all the very best for nurturing startup to shape the future of medical device industry in India and thank you thank you thank you so much Oh,